Since FromSoft's earliest Demon's Soulsing days, their games have been compared to Metroidvanias. For those out of the loop, the term Metroidvania is a portmanteau of Metro Castle and Samusvania, two old school NES games with labyrinthian like levels and spirit crushing difficulty. As Castlevania is the more fantasy of the two, I think it's fair to consider the FromSoft games as spiritual 3D sequels. After all, we never found out what a Castlevania game would have looked like in 3D. We never found found out what Castlevania would look like in 3D. In my quest to find the most fun character to play in Elden Ring, I've decided to turn the game into Symphony of the Night 2 Alucard Boogaloo. If you want to watch these runs live, check out my Twitch channel. I was doing them on Patreon, but the patrons voted to make them public streams. They are generous, and I am a greedy man, hoarding wealth in a massive content creator castle. Just kidding, I don't have a castle, but if you follow me on Twitch, I could buy one. In character creation, I tried to set my sliders to sad and chose the prisoner starting class. That gives us everything we need for Alucard from the start, namely a big pointy sword, some magical talent, and bisexuality. I'm not actually sure that the prisoners have to be bi, but come on, look at the depth of that V. It's not exactly subtle. We have no quarrel with the grafted scion. He was probably tortured by his father to become what he is. Relatable. Cowabunga in the limb grave. It's pretty sunny outside, but Alucard is only a half vampire, so that's fine. I swing by the Church of Ayla for the crafting kit. Then I use the S-Doc on this soldier. It's the only person I'm killing with the S-Doc in this entire run, so savor that. Saifa meets us at the Gatefront Ruins to give us a horse, but don't give pets as gifts, people. It's not a treat, it's a living chore that someone might not want to do. Luckily though, I did want a horse, so I use it to ride down to the southern edge of Lake Aguil and grab the Great Epi. I died while grabbing it, but that's fine. I have less than 200 runes. I'll let those go and enjoy this very, very long boy. At least we could if we had the stats for it. So let's take that horse and get the stats for it, but don't forget to give Alexander a couple of thrusts with your hefty length. What's better than this? Guys being dudes. Stop by the Church of America, warp to Grail, and hang a left after the first Dragon Bridge. There you can do some grave robbing for a few early runes. It's something I didn't know about before this run. Always learning here, hopefully helping you learn too. After touching the Grace by Fort Faroth, I warp back to Limgrave for the pickle, but end up getting invited the round table hold by Sypha. Not an issue. I actually need to sell a couple of things to get the proper stats for the Great Epi. Now that we have a sword, let's get some bloody tears. Back to the Church of America, I try to run across the pond to grab some fireflies. They're important for pickling later. But there are three bears defending them, so I died. But just barely. I almost made it out. We're on our way to Fort Height, not for the Dectus Medallion half, but instead for the Bloody Slash Ash of War. It's wielded by a jerk using a sword. I wonder if this impaling thrust Ash of War on my great epi goes through shields. It does. We win. After some brief detours for the whetstone and pickle, I head back to Fort Faroth and go to town on that dragon booty. It always takes a little bit, so I do fast top 10 suggested by the chat. If you follow me on Twitch, wow, you could suggest a top 10. That would be so neat. Since we've met the stats for our epi, we can dump all of those runes into Vigor to be nice and comfortable as we move through the beginning of the game. After grabbing the Radigan Sword Seal, which boosts our stats and lowers our defenses, we even get bitten by a rat on the ladder and live. Immortality is a perk of vampirism, but since Alucard is only half vampire, we don't need to drink blood. We just need pickles. Nerd juice is really easy. Since his daggers are tiny, 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 and my sword is hefty, 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 I can keep a distance with regular pokes. Eventually a Belmont shows up, but like, come on, you don't expect those miserable drunks to help out that much, do you? Inside, Patches tries to bamboozle us, but remember how we got Bloody Slash? Not because we're gonna use Bloody Slash, I'm saying remember specifically how we got it. We used Impaling Thrust, which pokes through shields. Easy peasy. All of these successes are making me feel kind of bold. Bold enough to make a pitch. What if what I do actually makes it so that this is a one stream video. I noticed that my equipment load was pretty low, so I thought I could save time from my practice run by grabbing the blue dancer charm from the high road cave. That boosts your damage when you're at lower equipment load. It changes up depending on your exact equipment load, but where we're at, it should be around 15%. There's a bit of platforming, but it's not too tricky. 
Trickier than the boss though, the Guardian Golem, that gets absolutely eviscerated when you critically hit its chest. I haven't upgraded my weapon at all, that is the base damage at the lowest possible stats to wield the Great Epi. Gosh dang. And the blue Dancer Charm is going to boost our damage by 15%. Not to mention, we no longer need Radigan Source Seal for the stat boost, since the blue Dancer's Charm damage will more than compensate. That means we're going to take less damage too. I still want to upgrade the weapon though, so off to the Limgrave Tunnels, where I can grab the rest of the smithing stones we need. Stone Digger Troll at the bottom gives us the Roar Medallion for Alucard's signature uh, scream attack. We don't need it. It's just faster to kill it than it is to ride the elevator back up. It's also a little faster to level up your weapon the first three times at the anvil at the Church of Ayla. So I pop back there and say hi to Ronnie. We have to mash through a bit of dialogue, but it's no big deal and saves us the trouble of buying the Spirit Calling Bell later. Now's where things get a bit greedy. The faster you can grab the Golden Scarab Talisman from the abandoned and cave the faster the run is going to go. It boosts your rune acquisition, leveling up faster makes you stronger, pretty straightforward. Only issue is that you have to run through the poop cave and beat the gank boss, the clean rot knight duo. The boss is scaled for Kaled, which we're a little low for at the moment, so it can be a bit of a struggle. I've given up on entire runs because I tried to do these two too early and got walled off. I'm a little bit worried this is a bad idea, but my impaling thrust pierces the first knight's guard, so taking him out goes pretty fast and leaves me to 1v1 the other one. I died the first time, but on the next run I got it. That means every boss after this will give us 20% more runes. Let's go get the first one. I summon a speaker magician named Rajir to assist. He's got an awesome Ash of War that summons three little swords that shoot out. It's almost like how Alucard can telekinetically swing his sword, at least the closest in this game. Pairing that with the Impaling Thrust, we're breaking Margit's stance like nobody's business. To quote our dad, one, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. two, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. three, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. four, four stance breaks, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. He's toast, letting us run through the rest of the castle. Venya. We'll take the safe path, which isn't safe. Gostok, the gatekeeper, wants us to die so he can loot our corpse. Who could imagine a gatekeeper being a jerk? His plan is to lock us in a room with a shield knight. Apparently, he hasn't heard what we do to shields. Rule of threes means this use of the impaling thrust is the funniest. That's not enough baloney, though. We need to deal with the birds. Birds that chase us into Roger's chapel, an area that prevents you from attacking. It does not prevent the bird from attacking. Roger, there's a bird in here handle it then it teleports out and i can finally kill it to talk to rajir and make sure he'll show up at the round table hold later i kind of feel like he's like into us we'll get him to give us that sweet sweet ash of war. Back through the Ballista Courtyard, weirdly that's the real safe path where people are just shooting a ton of arrows at you. After a pit stop at the secluded cell Grace, we check in with Nefeli, a buff lady who wants to help us stomp Godric. I think she also wants to date us. Who wouldn't? Look at us! I debated going to grab the rest of the smithing stones to get the weapon to plus 13, but I think we can handle this at plus 3. Uh, the second time. Yeah, much like our fight with Rajir, teaming up with Nefeli led to a ton of stance breaks on Godric. So he spends almost as much time stunned as he does fighting. It seems like Alucard can work with women and men. Let's go find ourselves a man. Rajir is back at the round table hold. He'll give us his sword, but more importantly, his ash. We can use that for the glint blade phalanx, which we can show off in the death touch catacombs. It's a very basic dungeon, but it ends with the black knife assassin. We bring out the glint blade phalanx, which summons four magic swords that fly around on their own and can be followed up with an extra attack. That extra attack does the same amount of stance damage as a jumping heavy attack. So 22 with the great epi and each of those four swords does 10 stance damage. So if just the swords hit, that's 40 stance damage, which is the same as the Flame of the Red Mains we used on Tanjiro, potentially followed by 22 from the extra attack. That's even better, and Tanjiro was amazing. Find yourself an Ash of War that breaks dance, and you win the game. Now we're going to ride down an elevator to the Saoirse Ronan River Well and grab the Inverted Hawk's Shield. It looks like the one Alucard uses sometimes. Then I died because I thought I could hop off a cliff safely. Um, and we also don't really end up using the shield. Kind of just better to kill stuff faster. That is the last of the aesthetics we can grab for now, so off to Lernia for a bunch of upgrade materials. And to fight the main boss of the area. These little turds that block the map. Just get out of my way, I hate hate you. I scoot around grabbing materials and the dexterity physic tier, which gives you plus 10 to dexterity for three minutes. It's basically a free 10 levels of damage. Boom. Down to the Raya Lucario crystal tunnel for more smithing stones. 
fully bully that Crystallion. Like, ugh, geez, I feel kind of bad. Then I go to the Ruin Strewn Precipice, which is overrun with bats, but I'm the Bat Master. The Bat God. I made one bat jump to its death when it can fly? Huh, then I fought even more bats. It's worth it to get the sword to plus 13. Now, normally I cut the bird hunting out of the videos, but I decided to do it all in one big chunk this time. So here's where we killed a bunch of birds. I wish I could use bat feet for the pickles. They are more on the way. With a pickle, we're ready to take on Magma Worm Makar, who is childishly easy with magical floating swords. I'd imagine most things are. Up to Altus, where we can activate the Radon Festival, but not until we have a boyfriend. Even though he can't come to the party, I don't know why I did things in this order. Looking back on it, it doesn't really make sense. Our boyfriend is back in Lernia. There's an evil horse guy on the path, so I bully him pretty hard and make our way to the cliff bottom catacombs. Honestly, I would have thought Trevor would be in the cliff top catacombs, but whatever makes him happy. It's a twisty little dungeon that eventually ends with an Erd Tree Burial Watchdog, a funky looking puppy that doesn't like being stabbed by four swords at the same time. He'll give up the Caden Cell Sword Ashes, which is actually Trevor using a sword. Unfortunately, no whip, but the coat is 100% Trevor. While in Lernia, I'll also body an Earth Tree Avatar, which drops the Magic Shrouding Physic tier that boosts our magical damage by 20% for 3 minutes. Now we're ready to party. Parties in Elden Ring involve a team of warriors teaming up to fight a god who was fighting stars. Radon hits really hard, but doesn't have a ton of health. We also have a bunch of folks hitting him at the same time, so we're able to get him to around 20% health by the time he hits phase 2. He actually only hits me one time before dying. Radon is easy, just summon the help and hit him hard. After he dies, we we talk to Alexander again, who's eating everyone who died during the fight. It's just being ecological, we can still be friends. We need to keep up Alexander's quest to boost our Ash of War even further eventually. For now, we just gotta run some errands in Altus. First, the Pearl Drake Talisman. It boosts non-physical damage resistance. I grab it every time, it's useful every time. Nearby, there's the Windham Catacombs, which have a bit of the weeds we need to level up the Belmont. Some gargoyles kill me, but it doesn't really matter. I was done in there anyway. Apparently, I missed a glove wart I needed in the cliff bottom catacombs, so I grabbed that, and then my cat wanted to say hi. Oh no, I died again, and I didn't get to spend the time climbing back to the top of the catacombs? Oh no. Riding up to Mount Gelmnir, we can chat with Alexander again, but to do so, we need to stand in literal lava while a dragon is chasing us. Honestly, worth it. Love this dude. And then Gelmnir Hero's Grave. The Hero's Grave dungeons have a bunch of traps and puzzles. This one specifically has a big old chariot. I wait patiently for it, make my way through, and grab one of the weeds I need before getting ganked by some phages. That stinks. I actually need more of the weeds in there, and now I have to dodge the chariot again. But being super frustrated actually makes it kinda cool. I am dodging and weaving like a total pro, and this time I'm not messing around. I'm killing everything and safely grabbing my weed. Except I forgot the post roll R1 aims up, so I whiffed and died again. Attempt number three. God dang. Finally, get the glove wart and sprint out cool guy style with the chariot inches away from my porcelain posterior. Next up is the demi-human queen for the ritual sword talisman. Boosts all damage by 10% at full health. That explanation probably took just as much time as this boss fight. Use those runes to upgrade Trevor to plus 7 with Rodrika, then down to the Weeping Peninsula for a couple more tears. Lord knows, Alucard has some tears. Since time is looking pretty good, I decided to take out some easy bosses that give a lot of runes. Putrid Avatar first, it's just like the Erd Tree Avatar, if the Erd Tree Avatar crapped his pants every time it did the butt slam. Also, this one does about five times as much damage, so, you know, don't get hit. Up next is Grail, the Vanilla Dragon. It's the most basic of basic dragons, just a gray boy, literally named Gray, that shoots fire and flies. Sometimes he flies wrong and lands on nothing? Okay, I'm gonna reset at the grace and do it again with more magic flasks. It still flies off the bridge, which should be illegal, but it dies when I stab it a lot. Back to progress now. If the guardian golems on the way to the tree sentinel will let me, I don't know what I did to make them so mad at me. Yeah, this is really fast each <laughs> Tree Sentinel time. It gets stunned with two hits from the Phalanx, or eight hits, depends on how you want to count it. So I used Trevor as more of a distraction than anything else, clear it out fast enough, and we get to enter the biggest castle in the world. To make it through, we're gonna need all the help we can get. A boyfriend and a girl.
we dive into the royal capital and need Trevor right away for an Erdtree avatar. He starts a fight with some other random guy instead. Whoops. After a bit though, he must just kill the guy because he comes back and helps us finish the job. Your first time through this game, you might skip this arboreal buddy, but trust me, slam him down for a lord's room. It's 50,000 runes for very little work. Also, don't drop down into the left part of the sewer. I just did that my first time and thought that was the best way forever. Nope, just run straight forward. You'll get a grace and drop into the sewer without breaking your tiny little knees. Never hurts to explore, kids. Running and running. Can't stop at this grace because the soldier is too hot on my trail, so I just run down and grab the proper attire. Inside the not fake round table hold is the Albrecht set, but it's actually the Alucard set. I mean, come on, look at that. Except, oh no, the hair clips through the collar. I didn't have hair in the practice run, that sucks. I noticed it on the way to the Ritual Shield Talisman, which boosts our defense at full health. We need it. While the Alucard set is very stylish, it is not heavy. That'll help us against Ghosty Godfrey, but not as much as just shooting him with four swords at the same time. I was bragging about how much better our damage is than Trevor's, but then I was about to die and he killed Godfrey, so I guess it is nice keeping him around. On the way to Morgoth, I try to get the jump on a Black Knife Assassin, but it gets the jump on me. Why would she be mad at me? Just bust out a fully charged R2 right away. Turns out she has the same weakness as five little monkeys jumping on the bed. She can't jump, I can. So I just use my ranged option and I win. Now it's Morgot time, but I can't do this alone. I need Sypha, I need Trevor. She's got magical abilities. I've got some magical abilities. Trevor is also here. He gets points for trying, he's just human. Morgot's really fast and can summon swords that attack automatically. It's such a cheap strategy, how dare he? We beat him by spamming the swords that we summon that attack automatically. And with the power of friendship, what would I ever do without them? I used Morgoth's runes to level up endurance so I can get to light load and roll with the shield equipped, even though uh, I'm not using it. I bogey through the Forbidden Lands and end up in the mountaintop of the Giants. There I grab the Smithing Stone Bell Bearing 3 and level the sword up to plus 18. Then it's time for the Fire Giant, a boss that's always kind of free. He's really slow and I can stun him pretty fast, then land a massive critical hit by stabbing him in the eye. Wait, that's uh, huh, that's not a lot of damage. And then I die. Okay, I tried switching out some of my talismans, and then the meteor attack killed me? I was right underneath him, I thought that was safe. Okay, weird. I died to the fire giant twice. Usually it's first try. I realized I needed to leave Trevor behind and do this alone. He's not that helpful. If I don't summon him, I can use the floating sword trick about six more times. So Trevor is gone and I'm fine, not sad at all. I died again. I'm a little sad. Let's drop the golden scarab and put on the blue dancer charm for more damage. It actually really helps me die again. Okay, four deaths to the fire giant. It summons the balls, they blow up, but that won't be an issue if I get in and stab it in the eye. When you critically hit, you get eye frames. Normally that means invincibility frames, but this time it literally means eye frames. And it? Well, the game didn't get it because I get no iframes and I died. Next time, I'm able to make it work. Get the crits and win with five deaths against the fire giant. And I didn't get the scarab back on time or use the pickle. It's like a whole level down the tubes. And then Sypha sets herself on fire. I'm so alone. Oh my God. I am losing my mind. Another day, another trip through Farama Zula, where I try and skip as much of this level as possible. Half the graces, double the sprinting. Heck, I'm even gonna fall right down this hole and go straight for the comment section grace. Thank you to the person in the comment section who told me about this grace. I summon a big hammer man and Trevor is back. We need all the help we can get against the Godskin duo. Or do we? Turns out Alucard does really well in a trio, other than that one time. Big stance damage can interrupt the duo, and then we can tag team bully them all together. The personal highlight for me? The floating sword stance broke the big boy out of his rolling attack. He's rolling and uh, no, it just feels so good. These guys have been such a pain in my ass in so many runs. Again though, even though this was a first try victory, this boss is bad. They give a smithing stone bell bearing four so we can max out our sword with one more dragon smithing stone from the mountain top of giants. Now I just need a few stone sword keys to go do something sad. The sad thing is not landing the swag dump, that's just cool. But up this little elevator, Alexander lies in wait. I fall down a hole, maybe as a tribute to him just before we duel. It's not much of a duel though, it's more of a slaughter. It's like Superman fighting a clay pot, or Alucard fighting a clay pot. He's a clay pot. That gives us the Shard of Alexander Talisman, which boosts the damage of our Ash of War, which was already busted. 
I don't think we're gonna die again. Whoops, I died trying to grab the Dragon Quest Shield Talisman for more physical damage resistance. Should I count the whoopsie jump deaths? I guess I should just get good at jumping. The Draconic 3 Sentinel is easy enough, just gotta bully him with our even stronger floating swords. Malaketh is never easy though. I get an early stance break, but that's in his Beast Clergyman phase. The Black Blade is the real danger. If he gets more than a couple of hits, I'm toast. The best way to handle him is just dealing as much damage as quickly as possible and learning to dodge his hits. The first time I fought him, I was so close, I just needed one more hit. Don't get greedy. You've got this. Gotta hit him one more time. Okay, I'm feeling really strong. Let's finish this off. One last ride. We are warped back to the Ashen Capital. It's the castle so nice, we'll vein ya it twice. Gideon Offnir is waiting there to get rocked. We've got a long sword, so we can just walk forward and slowly stab him. Then he dies. Up next is Godfrey, much harder than Gideon, which is like being harder than a wet napkin. We gotta deal with super fast axes, giant slams, and big spikes. Oh, and he can rip me in half whenever he wants in the game. Uh, third try victory. We have about 50 minutes left in the game before we hit six hours. Kind of an unofficial barrier for S tier. But Radagon and the Elden Beast have definitely taken that long before. So first, I round off my level by killing the rot dragon and go grab godric's great rune for plus five to every stat normally that's very good how could it be bad but since our weapon scales with three stats strength dexterity and intelligence that means it's 15 levels of pure damage in addition to more hp magic points stamina and defenses of all kinds even though we took some time running all those errands we're still maybe on pace to beat tanjiro for the fastest run so far but if we wanted to do that we'd have to beat radagon and the elden beast first try and i forgot to switch my flasks I wanted to have more magic so I could still use the floating swords against Radagon. Since I don't have the flasks, I mostly saved them for the Elden Beast. I used it a couple times, but not as spammy as I normally would be. And I missed a crit. That's pretty important for taking out Radagon fast. He also slams me when I miss time or roll. I'm just still so bad at dodging him. I don't know if it's because I'm panic rolling early or if he can buffer the rolls, whatever. I still managed to get through, but my flasks are low and Trevor is dead. So I'm gonna have to fire on all cylinders here. I open up with the full phalanx combo. We get a stance break in the first 20 seconds, followed by a full combo before the crit. That's a very solid start. I actually get another one, but after the crit, it does the move I hate most. Elden Stars. The bane of my existence. After it hits a certain HP threshold, it sends out this stream of light that slowly hits you with little other balls of light that you can't really dodge. Since it does it so late in the fight, it means you probably got precious few healing resources left. This was only the first try though, so it's no big deal if I don't win. I still have plenty of time to get it in under six hours. But what if I just did win? What if I beat the Elden Beast first try? For the first time in the history of these runs at 5 hours 18 minutes with 18 deaths and 24 bosses slain. It's actually going to go a bit behind Tanjiro in S tier since he had less deaths and killed more bosses, but this is still a firm S tier. So what makes it work? The Glimblade Phalanx is obviously a very big part of it. Each of the floating swords does 10 stance damage for 40 total, same as the Flame of the Red Mains. Then the Thrust is another 22 for over 50% extra stance damage. If you want to get through the game easily, find an Ash of War that breaks enemy stance and spend less time with the bosses being able to hit you. Then, break their HP with big critical hits. Oh, and put some armor on. Both this and Tanjiro would be double S tier if they could just take a hit. If you want to watch these runs happen live, they're on my Twitch now. Follow me over there, get the link in the description. Though, if you wanted to support me directly, I'd prefer it on Patreon. You also get way more rewards. And check out my other channel if you like Dungeons & Dragons. I build characters over there too.